Joseph's adventures were written down by scribes in about 600 BC, over a thousand years after the story was set. No record exists as to who wrote the tale or where they got their information. So debate has raged for centuries about whether it's pure fiction or a description of a real man's life. According to Alan Lloyd, professor of Egyptology at Swansea University, the truth might lie somewhere in between. One can see over and over again in other historical traditions that you can have a situation where there is a core of an accurate historical narrative, but a great deal uh, has in fact been bolted on. So what is the evidence? The story starts in Canaan, modern-day Palestine, Syria and Israel before the time of Moses, around 1600 to 1700 BC. It's told in the Bible, the Quran and the Torah. And they all say Joseph was one of 12 sons of Jacob, a wealthy nomad. A central thread running through the whole story is the rivalry between the brothers. According to Dr. Lloyd Llewellyn Jones, a specialist in family life, this sibling rivalry was strong because nomad chiefs in those times had more than one wife. Each wife wants their son uh, to become the next leader, to be the next uh, chief of the tribe or the next king in some cases. Uh, and this is certainly inherent within the story of Joseph where we see rivalries set up between the brothers from a very early age. Joseph, we must remember, and then Benjamin after him, is the son of uh, a second wife. Uh, the other brothers are, are all um, sons of other wives. So there is this rivalry that seems to go on there. But the object that ignited this rivalry more than anything was the coat given to Joseph by his father, Jacob. It's been portrayed as a garment of great elegance, a wash with color, the stuff of legend. But perhaps it's not so far-fetched. A visit to any middle or near eastern market or bazaar will show that vivid colors have been an important part of this culture for centuries. You can come to uh, virtually any Middle Eastern town or city uh, and find a workshop like this where fabrics are being made in exactly the same way as reported in a text or in wall paintings or in other uh, visual media in antiquity. Today in the modern Muslim or Arab world, there is a great emphasis still on colourful textiles and gift-giving of textiles too. Yet to the modern imagination trying to picture the ancient world, a life in colour is not what comes to mind. I think that we tend to envisage the ancient world in monochrome, uh, maybe because of our over-dependence on Greek and Roman statues. I think we have to put that out of our mind and remember that the ancient world, and again the Near East in particular, was a riot of colour. But most examples of colour in the ancient world only go back to 500 BC. The Joseph story is set 1,000 years earlier. To find evidence of color dating back to that time, we need to go deep into the Egyptian desert. remote tombs of Beni Hassan were built in 1800 BC. Wow. And according to Barry Gitlin, a professor of ancient history, they give us a unique glimpse into Joseph's era. We're here in the 12th dynasty tomb of Nunhotep III. Fantastic scene, scene that uh, I've lectured in my classes about for years. Numhotep was a high official of the pharaoh Amenemhat I, depicted on the wall of various scenes from his life. Some are people he lived and worked with, but there's one scene of a group of travelers with a very different appearance.
there are two main kinds of garb, both of which are striped. And each stripe being a separate color is very interesting. Plus, you see that there are designs within the stripes, which also adds to the, the differentness, the beauty, the importance of the garment. And as such, both represent the kind of garment that a uh, character like Joseph could have been interpreted by the writers of the Bible as having worn. Although these are images of multicolored coats in an Egyptian setting, there are signs that these travelers in fact come from Canaan, Joseph's homeland. All art of the period shows Egyptians as clean shaven, whereas Canaanites are always seen with beards. You look at these characters coming in, you just look at the beards, at the faces, and this is the, the common representation of the Semitic Canaanites coming in. The markets of the modern day Middle East and the tombs of Egypt suggest that Joseph did have a multicolored coat. But the evidence doesn't explain why his brothers acted the way they did. There must have been something else about that coat that generated such envy. One reason why can be found in the translation of the Hebrew word for coat in the Old Testament. Now, when we go back to the Hebrew, uh, as recounted in the book of Genesis, we seem to have an indication that the garment is a special garment. The word that's used to describe it is only found once more in the Old Testament, and that's in the first book of Samuel, where it's actually referred to uh, as a long-sleeved garment. And of course, long sleeves uh, make something quite impractical to work in. So it's uh, a sign of status if you can have long sleeves on your garment. But it wasn't just the long sleeves that marked out status. Great prestige would be attached to the choice of colors in the coat. In the ancient world, color was a precious commodity. <laughs> well, today we've got a myriad of colors that we can choose from. And they're all basically, since the 19th century, made from chemical dyes, which mean that they're solid, uh, they don't run at all, we don't really, on the whole, lose colour uh, in the wash. But of course, in antiquity, it was a completely different matter because every kind of dye stuff that we had, had to come from natural commodities. Indeed, some colours were harder to achieve than others. Blacks were difficult as textiles had to be saturated with dye to stop them turning grey. Whites required bleaching, a very complex process. But by far the most expensive dyes were reds and purples, colors worn by the semi-travelers in the tomb paintings. Red has to come from something like the stamen of the crocus flower. And of course, a tiny crocus only gives um, three or four stamen. So you need thousands of these things to create a, a solid color red. But without any doubt at all, the most important color that you could find in antiquity was a purple, a deep, deep, what we can call today imperial purple. A good, true purple has to come from harvesting the sea. It's created by uh, picking up tiny shellfish, mollusks, and it takes thousands and thousands of these things, which are dumped into a vat of boiling water, which ingeniously the ancients discovered gives off a rich purple dye when wool or linen is dipped into it. To be given a coat made of purples and reds, would have sent a very clear message to Joseph's brothers. Joseph was Jacob's favorite. It's no surprise then that this drove Joseph's brothers to get rid of him. According to the story, Joseph is sold to traveling merchants, but we only have the Bible's word for it. 
The Bible does, however, slip in an authentic detail. Joseph is sold for 20 shekels. Egyptian documents reveal that this is precisely the price you would expect. A few hundred years later, we find that the price is up to 30 shekels. And yet, down into the first millennium, it's up to 50 shekels and so on. So we see you can actually plot on a chart and see the cost of slaves going up. Now, with the Joseph story, this is an important detail because if the story is simply conjured up, made up, if it's just a novel from the end of Israelite and Judean history, you would expect that the, the author would not know what the price was five, six hundred, seven hundred years before. While Joseph is being hauled away to Egypt, his brothers smear his coat with goat's blood to fake his death. We're told that Joseph is sold as a slave to Potiphar, the chief of Pharaoh's army, a man in charge of soldiers, horses, chariots. He's rich and powerful with a large house and staff. No mention of Potiphar has ever been found in ancient documents. But the Brooklyn papyrus found near Luxor dates back to Joseph's time and proves that the use of Semitic servants was surprisingly common. During the late Middle Kingdom, which is a period when Joseph may well have come to Egypt, a well-to-do household of a nobleman uh, in Egypt had a good number of Semitic household servants, people who did work in the fields, people who did the weaving and so on. So a well-to-do estate would have household servants, we might even use the term slave, uh, to describe these people. According to the story, Joseph was given an Egyptian name, another custom confirmed by the Brooklyn Papyrus. Their master may have had a hard time vocalizing their foreign name, and so we have the name X, who is called Y. Now, X being the Semitic name, who is called Y, his Egyptian name. In the Joseph story, we have Joseph, who is called Zaphanach Paneach. The Bible says Joseph worked hard and did well, rising to take charge of Potiphar's household. But then his fate takes a dangerous turning, instigated by Potiphar's wife. She makes a pass at him. The incident may well be fictional, an attempt by the author of the story to paint Joseph as the innocent party. But according to Lloyd Llewellyn Jones, the episode can't be ruled out altogether. When it comes to women in antiquity, and certainly when compared to their Hebrew or Semite sisters, elite women in ancient Egypt have a remarkably autonomous life. They have a considerable amount of freedom. We know, for example, that they could divorce at will, that they had the right to their own property. We find this uh, legal status uh, to be really quite remarkable for a woman's lot in antiquity. Joseph rejects her advances.